Hi, my name is Elijah, and welcome to my podcast, Songwriting for Songwriters. Today, my guest is Pete Schweer. Pete is a producer. He's just recently been working with Dexys, and uh, their new album, Divine Feminine, is currently sitting at number four on the UK charts. And I thought it'd be quite interesting to uh, change it up a bit this week and speak to a record maker, a producer, on his opinions of songwriting and to get his insights and guidance as a producer into making records. Pete has worked with some of the biggest names in the industry. He started out as a uh, apprentice tape op at Mickey Most's Rack Studios. He's worked with Yes, The Who, Thin Lizzy, Paul McCartney, Pink Floyd, Elton John, Brian May, Supertramp, The Pretenders, The Police, Dire Straits, Hot Chocolate, and he's also worked with me and my band, The Gravity Drive, and we're good friends. So uh, Pete has lots to say about uh, making records. He lets us into some of his stories from his glittering career. He talks about his long-term relationship with songwriter Kevin Rowland from Dexys and the Midnight Runners and gives us some advice into making records and songwriting. So uh, this is a slightly different episode and it's the first of a few I'm going to be doing with different producers. Please enjoy it. Check out Pete's website, peteshwear.com and subscribe to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Joining me today on the Songwriting for Songwriters podcast is Pete Swear. Pete, how are you doing? I'm fine. Good to see you, Elijah. Thank you for being my guest today. I appreciate it. Um, as you may or may not know, we've been speaking to songwriters predominantly, well, mostly on this podcast, but it came to me a while ago that it would be very interesting to speak to producers um, who are obviously often great musicians themselves, but they work with songwriters all the time. And so I kind of thought it'd be an interesting perspective to get. Now, you're someone who's worked with the biggest names in the business from uh, Crikey, I've got a list here, The Who, Thin Lizzy, Paul McCartney, Dexys Midnight Runners, Pink Floyd, Elton John, The Super Tramp, The Pretenders, The Police, Hot Chocolate. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And you've been in the industry for a long, long time. So before we get into kind of the nitty gritty, I want to know like what got you into music and what made you decide to to become a producer and an engineer? What 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 made you make that decision? Um, I um, I don't want well, to always, always love music. I studied music at school uh, from a classical point of view, and I had a band from the age of about eight. And we made our first recording. In fact, my sister and my brother and me in our living room on a reel-to-reel uh, tape machine with about two, one microphone or two microphones. And we got back a vinyl disc that we we still got. Actually, my brother sent it to me a while ago. Wow. Um, and I thought, I don't know, that was the start of it. I had no idea what I was doing. I was about 13, I think. Anyway, like I said, I had a band and I played uh, clarinet and studied music A level. And I, did, I had no idea about recording studios, but I loved music. I loved all the albums that were coming out at that time in the 70s. And um, and then my mum went to see her cousin, who she was evacuated to the war with. Wow. Who we didn't see very often, but uh, he happened to own Advision Recording Studios in London, where they were doing T-Rex and David Bowie, wow. amongst others. Um, and she said to me, I said, oh, I, I just finished my A-levels and I didn't, I was kind of going, going to university, kind of not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, and I said, oh, I'll come with you. You know, anyway, I went up to London with her. Sorry, my thing ping, pinging away. I, don't I went up to London with her and um, and uh, and walked in the, the studio and they were doing uh, Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds. So I don't know wow. that album. Jesus Christ. And I walked in, in one room and, and David Bowie was in the other room. Of course, I didn't see them because it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. They were still in bed. But um, but I walked in there and I thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. This is exactly what I want to do. So my Rod, Roger Cameron, his name was, he was also a very famous engineer. Um, he worked a lot of lot of stuff in the 60s and 70s. Um, he, As I said, he owned the studio. So he, I said, this is what I want to do. And he said, well, I don't think it's good because your family that you come and work with us. He said, but, you know, here's a load of studios, write, write letters to them and see how you get on. And then I got a job at, um, as you know, at Rack Studios with Mickey Most in wow. 1977, a long time ago. Yeah. I'm feeling ancient. <laughs> so that was the start of it. Yeah, and I, when I started in the studio, as a, I, was a, I was the first uh, tape up, you know, straight coffee boy, if you like, at the studio, which had just been built at the time. They were literally yeah. finishing off. So I was the first guy in there working which ha- also meant that i moved up through the ranks a lot quicker because there was nobody sure. ahead of me right to right, wait right. to leave so i was i was engineering within about a year actually wow okay 
Yeah, well, so it's, yeah. A, it's quite an old story. I, I, it was purely by chance, really. That was all it was. Wow. Okay. And so training, I mean, training at Rex is an amazing studio and obviously being responsible for, and I'm sure you've probably been responsible for a lot of those records that came out of there. And Mickey Most is a quite a, um enigmatic character. So was he, was that kind of like literally with him in the room training and kind of learning his techniques? And Yeah, yeah absolutely. He, yeah, absolutely. He, I mean, I did all the hot chocolate, uh, Susie Quattro, Exile, Kim Wilde, uh, 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 racy all those bands that he had at the time um and li yeah he, mickey was a great producer i mean um he was not an engineer or he was just a, he was a musical uh, mus he, I don't, he, he was sort of a musician but not a great musician and technically an engineering side of it he didn't really know what, what, what he was doing but he managed to make a record sound amazing right um so i used to uh work with him it would be just him and me and I would get all the sounds together. I was only like 18, 19 years wow, old. Wow, wow, wow. Um, like I said, I'd been in the studio for like two months or whatever it was. And um, so I'd get all the sounds together. And he would come in and, and tweak it a bit and say, no, 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 I like it like this, whatever. And then then we'd do the recording. Um, and I would be kind of part engineering, part tape hopping, and then he would jump in. And then on the mix, he would do the mix himself. He would, I, I would be there. And I remember the funny thing about Mickey was the uh, we were mixing onto quarter inch tape in those days, and I remember the needles banging into the red when he was mixing, and 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 the maintenance engineer Hugh would come in and look at them and, go, and kind of look at me and go, oh "God, what's he doing? What's he doing?" You know, but that's his sound. It was like this compressed right sound. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's quite, actually interesting. Sorry, go no, on. it's quite interesting what you're saying. At some time, like you know, there's there are people that in the, from my experience in the uh, recording industry. Uh, recording side of things that are like technicians you know engineers and technicians and then you get these sort of mad characters that kind of produce and mix from their own kind of like uh instincts which is maybe what you're saying mickey was doing in, in that kind of way yeah absolutely it's quite a few people like that i remember um i also went with alex Sagan, who sadly passed away uh a few years long, long time in a car crash but um he was amazing he worked with bob marley mm. um and Grace Jones and I did a Duran Duran album with him, and and Hot Club, which was a spin-off of the Sex Pistols, I did with him as well. And I think we were doing the Hot Club album at the time. And um, I remember uh, we were recording a guitar or something, and, and it was going into the red a bit. And I and I went over to, to turn the mic amp down, and I said, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" I said, "Well, it's getting a bit hot. I just thought I'd you know tweak it down a bit, Alex." And he said, "Well, hang, hang on, listen. Does it sound good?" I said, "Yeah, it sounds great." He said, "Then leave it." Right. That, that was his. Yeah. If it sounded, it wasn't distorting, and so yeah, I think I think I, th I think a lot of the um, best producers are are like that. Steve Biddle yeah. is another one. You know, they're very spontaneous. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So it kind of like it's relying upon feel, isn't it? As well as the sort of technical aspect. I mean, there is obviously a technical job of collecting the capturing the sound, but that feel thing is uh, a sort of an interesting, interesting area, which is you can't really. It's not rational, is it? Sometimes feel. No, and I remember a funny thing. Uh, I, I can't. Remember, I think it was Hot Chocolate. Every, everyone's a winner. I think it was that single. June. And we were missing it in Iraq. And Mickey said to me, "Oh, well, I'm going up to Abbey Road now to Chris Blair, who's a really famous uh, mastering engineer, um, to master it." And he said, "Do you want to come, Pete? You know, have you seen the mastering?" I said, "No, I've never been in the mastering room." So he said, um, "Do you want to come?" I said, oh, "Yeah, great. That'd be great." So I went with Mickey in his in his nice 911 Porsche, whatever it was. <laughs> Like round the corner from Rack and went up to Abbey Road, and then we went into the uh, the mastering room, and uh, there's there was the console, uh, you know, like as normal, and in the middle of there was a little there's a, a button which which was off, and then it said Rack, so there was Rack and off, and um and I was sitting there, and and um, they, Chris was doing what he did, and and he said, oh, yeah, this sounds great, Mickey, no worries, um. And then Biggie said, come over, Pete, come over, have a listen. What do you think? I said, yeah, it sounds great. So he, then he turned around to Chris and said, Chris, put the rack button on. So he turned the rack button on. And then Mickey said, what do you think of that? I said, oh, that sounds better, doesn't it? He said, it doesn't do anything. It's just a joke. Ah. <laughs> so I was like such an idiot because I was so, you know, I was like in this place and I didn't know what to say. I said, yeah, oh, yeah, it sounds great. You know, but it was, he was just winding me up. It was actually, and then did, did nothing. It was just a rack button. I'm not sure whether it was you that told me this. It may have been Jim Lowe, actually. Um, but he was saying that this is quite often producers will assign a button or a dial for the uh, a and R men or yeah. record people to kind of like because they don't because they'll suggest that something needs to happen, so they'll assign a button to get them to change it, but nothing's changing. It's uh, no, I, have, I, have, I haven't done that myself, but I do know 
engineers and producers who have done that yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. um Listen, you obviously clearly progressed from like being, uh, you know, an engineer tape up in 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 rack to like being a freelance producer and engineer. So, one of the questions, I guess, which is quite interesting to me as a songwriter, maybe to someone who's listening, is when someone contacts you, let's say, I don't know whether in whether if they haven't worked with you before, or even if they have, hmm. when someone contacts you with some demos or songs. What are you listening out for and looking out for before you say yes to a project? What is it that you are as you know? What is it and what do you have to hear in the song to say yes to something? Um, mainly, does the song grab me? Do, 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 you know, does it um, hit, hit the right buttons? Um, and also potentially, is it a single? Sometimes it's often because it's all revolved in music, and I've done quite a few albums which um, sadly haven't had any singles on, but have been great albums. Yeah. So yeah, I listen to that. I think I think my, first my first thing impression is, you know, do I like it as a piece of, as a punter? Does it kind of affect, do I get it? Yeah. Um, does it move me emotionally? Uh, what could I do with it? You know, how 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 in my head would I see it progressing? Which and there, I was thinking about it the, the, the other day when you asked me to do this. But, um, there's kind of three or four different scenarios of, of that process. You know, from from getting a song from a songwriter. Um, I don't know if you want to discuss that, but I'd, I'd, love, to. One of the, I'd love to. One of the things is, uh, for example, when with going back to Mickey, when Errol Brown used to come in with, uh, well, he had loads of hits, singles, didn't he? Um, but he used to go up into Mickey's office with a guitar and sit in the office and play it on, on right. the guitar and sing it to Mickey. That's how he did it. And then Mickey would take it and we'd do the drums, etc. And then you have this scenario where you have a band. I remember mixing, I, I recorded in the mixed... Uh, well, I worked with the jam on going underground, um, setting suns and all my cons. Wow. And I recorded the mixed Eaton rifles with um, Vic Smith, the producer. Yeah. And on that scenario, the, the band basically walked in and played the song. There was no, they'd been in rehearsals, obviously, but as it was a band and they'd written the song, they had it all worked out. And our job um, was just to record it. So yeah. it was quite straightforward. Yeah. So there's, there's those different kind of, actually, I also read, I don't know if it's true, but, um, but I understand that uh, Noel Gallagher, did the same thing with uh, what's the story morning glory he he went in and recorded the acoustic guitar for right. the drummer to play the rhythm to and that's yeah. how i don't know yeah. i'm sure he didn't know that mickey uh, errol did that but that's a similar kind of thing sure sure yeah sure, so sure. It's, it's, it's kind of how what you what how you can what you can think you can do as a producer to make the songs into something special did you say there was a third way as well like obviously the, the, someone comes in with the acoustic plays the song <clears throat> or the band are tight and ready to go and the job is to capture but I mean, it feels like you, I mean, there's another way, isn't there as well, where someone's maybe like feeling their way or doesn't know or is creating yeah. some sort of odyssey and they're not quite sure where they're going as well. Is that, that... Yeah, that's right. I, I quite a good example of that is is the Pet Shop Boys albums that I've done. And that, and that nine times out of 10, um, Neil and Chris, we, we would, they would book a studio, normally at Sarm. And um, they would come in and we, we were basically do the thing from scratch where Pete Gleddle would be the programmer and they wouldn't have a, really have a clue what they wanted to do, but they just mm. come in and Chris would, uh, Chris would say, um, oh, I've got this idea for the drum loop and he'd, and he'd sit there and do the drums and then Pete would kind of finesse it a bit and then Neil would say, oh, this is, let me do, let me do the, the, the uh, a synth pad and he'd do that and he'd say, let me go and sing a bit. So that, you kind of build it up and that was a, with the perch up and with Trevor Horn, we used to do that a lot. I remember, um, doing a propaganda album with uh, Claudia Brooken with Trevor when I was his engineer. And um, we spent about four or five days doing this backing track um, on on the Sony uh, digital multi-track. So we had two, uh, we had 48 tracks, two machines going. Literally we spent days and Trevor was in at the beginning and said, oh, to try this, try that, do that guy. And then he disappeared and then he came back. And we thought, it was, we thought this track was sounding pretty good. And um, he walked in and we played it to him and he, he went over to the two tape machines and put them all 48 tracks into red, hit the record button and wiped it all. He wow. said, no, I don't like that. Yeah, wow. he wiped the whole lot. Okay. And I, he said, I don't like that. And I thought, I, I just thought, bloody hell, you know, you should at least keep it for yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. days doing this thing. But he was so, uh, had this vision of how it wanted to be that he knew it wasn't right. So he just wiped it. So what out of those three kind of like, I mean, and there's many ways to make a record, but out of those three ways, is there an approach that you prefer as a, as a producer to work with, um, no, I like all three. I like um, 
I love I love work, I love working with bands because I love the whole thing of the band playing in front of you. It's like yeah. live recording generally, although it's not quite live. But I mean, yeah, generally you, you you try and get the essence of it all being live. I really really love that. But I also re really enjoyed um, doing things like the Petra Boys and and working with Trevor on Frankie Goes Hollywood and that kind of stuff. Um, I also did um, a Kim Appleby album uh, with a single "Don't Worry" back in the early nineties um, with George DeAngelis, who was like a keyboard player that we worked with Trevor we both worked with Trevor Horn and we went off and did this thing and we did the single Don't Worry um, and Kim and Craig her partner at the time literally had a verse and a chorus that's all they had on a little I think they did it on a some sort of uh, demo tape thing but it was really basic it was basically the verse and the chorus and then George and I took that and we made an intro uh, we took the chorus and slowed it down and made the intro and, and then and then did all the arrangement and then we added and we made a middle eight with Kim um as well. So the middle eight was written in the studio. Um and then we carried on working on it. And then this is all in pre-productions, not in the studio, this was in George's basement. Yeah. Until we had this whole track that um and it, and I knew at the time that um it was definitely mm. what I call a filthy pop uh, single, you know, it was it was definitely <laughs> And yeah. it was it, it stayed at number two for about twenty four weeks, I think. Wow! And it was only, only didn't get a number one because the Robin Hood um, Brian Adams uh, okay was out at the time, <laughs> and it was keeping us off the number one stop. So it only went to number two. But that was um, yeah. And I remember Kim at the end saying, um, "I think she said to me, now I really understand what you do, Pete.' Right? You know, so I think she, when, we, when we finished the whole album, and it was a great album. Yeah. Like I say I call it filthy pop because it's that kind of music, but um, which I also love as well. I mean, I love all sorts of music. Sure, so sure. That was, an, that was an interesting process. I, I kind of like all of it, really. And working yeah. with you, as you know. Um... One of the things I'd like, I mean, you know, you're my, my friend first, but we've you've been very um, kind to, to us and generous to with your time to our band. But I remember, like, one time at kind of uh, playing you a few demos and, uh, you know, it's like, and just one time he was like, don't like that song. And I was like, okay, that's not working for me. And I was like, that's really good that someone's like, the rest of them I like, but that one's not working for me. So, in 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 you know in my band, I like I like that kind of honesty because it shows that someone's listening and they've got a, an opinion, so you can rely on them because they've got an opinion. When when you hear a song for the first time, do you do you have a, like a kind of yes no feeling to it? And also, do you have do you know where to go? Do you know do you have an instinct of like what you want to do straight away or like how to make that into a record? I definitely, I definitely have a, um, my gut, my gut reaction. Yeah, I, def I definitely have that. And whether it's right or wrong, I don't know because I'm sure yeah. I've been proven wrong a few times. <laughs> and then, um, and if it's a yes, if I think this is great, um, I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't say I had a, a. I know where to go exactly with it straight away necessarily, but um, you get I, you get a, you get the, the feeling of what you could do. In fact, we've had those discussions, haven't we? In, in this in this room I'm in now. Yeah, talking about what you could do with your songs, and 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 Ava would say, "I hear it like this," and he'd be saying, "I hear it this," and Ryan would say, well, "I hear the drums like this," whatever. And um, I, I know there's a couple of uh, songs I, I actually didn't get to work on that you did mm. after we'd had that those meetings, and um, and they sound out great. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting process. Yeah, but I definitely. I think I rely on what, as I said before, what moves me and what kind of gets my gut and what what I think is great, um, and th and after that is you know it, it is what it is. Really, you kind of have to go through yeah. the processes. So I get excited yeah. about it. I mean, there was actually there was quite funny. There was a period in my life in the eighties when when um, I was mixing mixing and 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 more mixing actually a lot of the a lot of hit hit um, radio tracks you know top twenty tracks and I got a bit of a without blowing my own trumpet I got a bit of a reputation of being a radio mixing engineer I had I, I managed to make things sound good on radio and, and people used to come to me and say um, on on their album they would say um, which which one do you think is a single then Pete right, right and I used to say well I think that's a single and that's a single and and yeah. it was quite funny because I got a bit of a it was stupid really because it you know it was no, just it's me. It's, it's, it's like it's what... me saying what I, what I felt but um yeah so people we used to have a bit of a laugh about it you get was right. For, yeah. I was going to. One of my questions, actually, have you ever had a um? Have you ever sort of like had a hit where you didn't think a song was going to be a hit, and have you ever sort of 
um the other way around as well have you ever sort of um said something is a hit and it hasn't been a hit have you have you have you sort of had that experience of something becoming something you didn't think was going to be it and it, did, am i making sense though do you know what i mean yeah 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 i mean i have yeah i had um one of the one of the dexie songs from the 2012 one day, one day i'm gonna soar up which did reasonably okay one in the top 10 mm. but there's a track called um she's got a wiggle yeah yeah which I thought was really, really commercial and really, really good. And I uh, and I remember actually having a conversation with Kevin Rowland walking to lunch one day when we were recording. And I said, Kevin, that's a hit. I'm, you know, honestly, trust me, that's a hit record, Kevin. Um, and it wasn't. It didn't get any radio play. Radio 2 play, wouldn't play it for whatever reason. Mm. Um, although we've had a lot of, as Dexys, we've had a lot of problem um, getting stuff played on Radio 2 for some reason. I think, I don't know what it is, but... um. Yeah, so that was one time. Um, have I had it? I can't think of a, a hit that's um, that I didn't think was, was going to be a hit necessarily. But yeah, I've had, I've definitely had a few that I thought were that haven't been. Yeah, sure. So we, I mean, sometimes yeah, like you know, it's a weird thing, a hit thing, because it's like obviously there is people will hear a song and they'll hit and and they'll feel it as a hit, but the powers that be, which are promotion, radio, record companies, they can prevent a hit from a natural hit from being yeah. a hit, can't they? And if you remember the first track I mixed for you, I was convinced um, and went on and on and on, on, on to you about the fact it was a, it was a big hit single. You did, and then, <laughs> it, it, it did it all right, didn't it? But it, it wasn't as big as I thought it was going to be. Well, it was like one of those things. A lot of people thought that about that tune. Trick is trick of the light, and um, you yeah. know, it's still, it's still sort of love for. But I think you know, there's one of those things where there's. I think hit making these days is is a is well you have to have a, a machine behind you, and that it's not may maybe it's not quite the same as it used to be, but. Um, but listen, yeah, as well. in terms of like, you've worked with a lot of massively talented, huge, successful songwriters. And um, obviously each act is different. Each relationship you have with them is different. But do you think this is like a kind of quality or characteristic in a songwriter, which is different from musicians or producers and engineers that sort of they have something going on? Or do you think it's or not? At all, not to mythologize, not to make too much of a myth out of it, but you, can you can you see something in in the kind of songwriting? Yeah, definitely. Bit? What is it? Do you no, think? Absolutely. I, I would I would say all of the one, the, all of the successful ones. Well, not not necessarily six. That was the wrong thing. But yeah, any songwriter, they definitely have something special. I think the ability to write a song, whoever you are, is amazing. You can be a great guitar player. I know lots of great um, drummers, guitar players, bass players, keyboard players, but they're not songwriters. And and if and, and a lot of them, if they've tried to be write songs, haven't they haven't necessarily been any good? So I think there's definitely um, you've got to have that bit of star star quality mm. uh, to, to actually write a song, especially successful songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I think it's um, yeah. Even I mean, like working with um, Prefab Strap, Paddy McLean, who I'm a huge fan of. And love working with him, but there's there was just something special about him, and also he was the singer, the songwriter, and the singer as well. And I think that's also uh, uh, something very special. When because when because once he started singing the song that he'd written, there was more emotion in it somehow. Yeah, you know, because it was his song. I'm sure you have the same thing when, when you do your song, your the vocals on your song. But yeah, without doubt, there's without doubt there's a star quality to songwriters. I'm very jealous. I've tried writing songs. Have you? <laughs> I have. I have tried. I actually. Um. I my only claim to fame was that on that that Kim Appleby track I told you about. I actually helped write the middle eight. I wouldn't say I wrote it at all, but I came up with a few ideas for the lyrics for Kim and said, well, "What about if you you said about this and 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 I think I produce. There's a fine line between producing and um songwriting as well because mm. um I think uh. Some producers might think they're they've added they've been part of the songwriting mm. you know, when they, when, when the productions being made, but I don't necessarily think that's true. And, you know, that's kind of interesting actually, because it leads me on to a different question. Was like what one of the kind of most important relationships in music is like well, you get the kind of sing frontman and the guitarist like Jagger Richards and whoever, and then the other important relationship from my perspective is the songwriter and the producer. And you have that often with, I can't remember the name uh, of the guy, but Neil Young had a producer he worked with all the time. And then you got obviously George Martin, the Beatles. Uh, and you and Kevin Rowland from Dexys have a long-term relationship uh, working together. Mm. And so it's 
kind of interests me, like Nigel Godrich and Radio Head are another one. Like it's interesting that that relationship because people return to people and work with people for a reason. And it's either because, well, I presume it's because they kind of, someone understands their ideas. There's a flow, there's a friendship, there's a magic that person adds, or there's a kind of like safe space that the person creates for the artist to be in. So I'm really interested to know like what your, you know, what your relationship is with Kevin, what the kind of repeated uh, working th- environment. Why do you think that is that way, and and sort of what you add to, um, if anything, to his kind of record making and so. Song- I think with Kevin, um, it's a build up of of trust um, over over forty years now. In fact, he, we, he, um, the new Dexys album is out today. Wow! And is uh, album of the week in um, the Guardian. Yay! Great stuff. Well, which is quite amazing. Yeah, and it's got great. Yeah, it's a fantastic review. Fantastic. And I was quite nervous about it because it's very, very. I think I told I sent you one of the songs, didn't I? Yeah, it's, it was great. I'm sure, I sent you that. Yeah, yeah. And I was quite nervous about it because it is very different. But um, yeah, I think we're, so. I'm not dive, dive going off the subject. But um, yeah, well, Kevin, I think it was. Uh, well, I mean, when I first worked with him, um, it was quite a tense uh, relationship. You know, he wouldn't trust anybody. I remember one point he every time I, my hand would go to the, the EQ settings, or he said, "What are you doing?" And I'm saying, "I'm just doing this, Kevin." He go, "Oh no, 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 I don't like that. Don't do that." Or he kept on asking questions, "What I was doing?" Why? And and now yeah. he completely trusts me. I mean, he doesn't even oh. come come to the mixes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so then there's that side of it, um, and I think we've done how many? I don't know, six or seven or eight. I, I, I can't remember how many albums, but um, and some of them very successful, and some of them not and some of them got completely slated like my beauty at the time but have since been you know praised yeah. as you know a great great piece of work so it's quite uh with hit kevin and i it's we've had this kind of volatile relationship of um with with the press and um and with the fans to some extent where they expect to have another come on come on Eileen and kevin's done some something completely different and i guess he we, we've just had the relationship where and I always, with Kevin, I always um, expect the unexpected and I never question uh, any ideas he has because he'll tell me to do something. And in my head, I'm thinking, not tell me to do something, but he'll say, let's try doing this. And I'll, in my head, I'll be thinking, that's a really bad idea, Kevin. I, you know, I don't want to do that. Why are we doing that? Or, mm. you know, th- I, I think we should try something else. But I, I don't. And, and, we, and we try the And actually, nine times out of ten, I sit back and listen to it after we've done it, and I'll say, "Okay, that's great. That's a really good idea." Mm. So uh, I think he's. He, I think so. I I kind of sit back a lot with him and let him do what he has to do. Yeah. And like I said, I think the trust is the biggest thing as well that he knows. And he always says to me, um, "He's very, very complimentary and he's lovely." I mean, you know, he will always say to me, "That mix sounds amazing. What you've done, Pete. You know, I don't know what you've done, but it sounds great." Or you know, very rarely does it these days, in the last 20 years or whatever, has he said, um, I just really don't like that mix, Pete. Can you start again? I mean, it's always been, it sounds great, but can we try tweaking this or turn the guitar up or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, so I think we have got this relationship. Um, and it's over time, you just get, when yeah. you work with people over time, you just feel more comfortable with them, don't you? I think it's just a really fascinating uh, relationship, you know, because it's like you said, This it sounds like you are um, helping him facilitate his ideas without judgment and joining in you know it's like you're both going out to play together and he's kind of I suppose leading the way a little bit but you're kind of yeah. allowing that to happen and sort of facilitating all of his ideas which is it's quite a yeah. role it's quite a role to have when some we're in creativity I think yeah it is and I think I think um I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan of his you know um I, I love his voice you know yeah. I, I think that's I think if you if you if you're a producer or a mixing engineer or just recording engineer, whatever you're doing, so I don't mean just recording or a recording engineer. Um, if you if you love the music and you love the singer, yeah, it's, that's a real that's, that's that's for me is where I've been so lucky in, in my career that working with some amazing make people who, I mean, I remember the first time I met um, Brian May. I was, I was introduced to work with Brian by a, a mutual friend, a guy called Kaz. Who who did all their promotions and marketing and um and I knew him because I'd worked on another project, a Japanese project for him actually, for the for him and um and I was so nervous I was only about 
24 or something like that. Can I, 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 I wasn't that far advanced in my career at the time. Mm. I was such a huge fan. I remember when I was 15, 16, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody was number one all through the summer. And yeah, um, we all love Queen. And um, and I met him at Rack. And he, um, and he came uh, with his guitar and his amps. And um, he said, you know, we just said hello. And he's such a charming guy anyway. And I, but I was really, really nervous about recording his guitar. <laughs> Sure. And I, I said to myself, look, okay, just do what you think's right, Pete. Don't, you know, just do it. So I put the microphones up that I thought I should put up, blah, blah, blah. And he went out and he played and he came and he went, oh, that sounds great. I love that, Pete. I love the sound you've got. And that was it. I was fine. And now wow. I work with him. I, and I'm still in touch with him now. But yeah. Then I worked with him for seven or eight years after that. And um, yeah, so it's, so I've lost the thought. What was I talking yeah, about? Yeah, but that's a really good, there's a really important thing you say there, which is like actually you can get overwhelmed by like the kind of myth of somebody. But actually, what you did there was just tune into yourself and your instinct and your ears. And and whether you're a songwriter or a producer, like actually, that's that's your sound, isn't it? And signature is you tuning into you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's super important. What what song? Yeah. If you could, um, what's? It's, I know it's hard to do because they're all your babies. But like, what song or album do you think you're most kind of proud of being a part of and and creating? Can you can you? Uh... Sort of, I think it'd be hard to to choose one to be honest with you, mm. um, but I think "Don't Stand Me Down." If we were talking about Dexys, the "Don't Stand Me Down" album, I was really really proud of, and that was um, again I was really young, I was like twenty two or twenty three years old then. Wow! Um, I remember playing the the cassette of "What She uh, What She Like" on the way. We we, we mixed it at uh, Kim and Ricky Wilde's studio in in, in Nebworth, and I used to living in Battersea, so I used to drive quite away from Nebworth back to home. Mm. And I was playing it on a cassette, and I was we just finished the mix. And bear in mind, the song's nine nine minutes long. Uh, tell me what she's like. And I remember driving home and, and playing it at like full blast, and thinking, "This is bloody great!" This and this is the best thing I've ever done. You know, wow. I'm so proud of this. And then it got completely slated. Actually, I mean, and poor old Kevin, it, it knocked him for six for quite some time. Mm. And I, I, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't. Uh... So anyway, that the album I think is great. Um, a lot of the Pet Shop Boys albums I've done. I mean, I, I don't know. I couldn't really. That's not a fair Ab, question. The, the crazy the, um, Head Like a Rock game and Ab that I did. Yeah, because I spoke to Ian a few weeks ago and um, I, I had been slightly aware of the album, but I listened to it. It's so good. <laughs> like, it's so good. It's like that whole Neil Young um, crazy horse thing, but like in no way is it copying. It's just this expansive the album keeps giving to you. it's such a great album and, and then I, I went into your website last night and went, oh Pete's done that like it's such a great record isn't it it's oh, a, you, yeah. what are your memories I, of that I remember it really really well and um yeah at the, I remember th um, again I remember thinking at the time this is great when I was mixing it we mixed it at Mayfair in London on an Eve desk and um I think it took about three weeks maybe and it's quite a funny story because in actual fact, it was supposed to be mixed by somebody completely different, by an American engineer who flew over and got to Heathrow and then and didn't have a... He told them he could come to work and he didn't have a visa, so he got turned around and sent back. Yeah. And then the record label rang up my my manager, Annie, and said, we, we've got a real problem. We've got a studio, but this album needs to be mixed. Have you got anybody you know who, who you can recommend? And Annie said, well, um, Pete's just finished something, whatever... Uh, and then I met and I met them and, and I so I mixed it. It was, it was by chance in a way, um, but I remember mixing it. Was, and I remember I remember that on the last the, we had a, like a play that night at, um, as you did in those days, and all the record label came and friends and people from the press, and my wife came. We weren't married at the time, but um, she came, and I mean Ian, myself, and my wife played the album probably fifteen times. Until about four or five o'clock in the morning, and I remember I remember watching my wife's face going, "Wow, this is great!" And Ian was like lapping it up, and he and he was he was obviously enjoying it. Yeah, so it was it was, um, it was fantastic. And then of course it was uh, Mercury Award nominated, mm. and it was the, the year before it was televised. And I was right. talking to someone about this uh, quite recently that if and they reckon that if if it had been the televised one, which happened a year later. That album would have kind of rocketed. Yeah, you know, I can see that. Would have seen it on TV, and but unfortunately, yeah. it didn't win it. I can't remember who won it that year, but it came. It was like runner-up or something. 
But great yeah. album. I remember, I remember sending off to Metropolis to be mastered and uh, Tony the Mastering Engineer. Was it Tony? I think, oh, no, Tim Young. I remember him ringing me up and saying, Pete, that's the best thing you've ever done. It sounds amazing. Wow. It does sound yeah, yeah. it does sound really I mean anyone out there should check it out. Head like a rock by Ian McNabb. It's a really great record. Um yeah. what as a producer and an engineer and a music fan, but particularly as a producer and engineer, what what advice would you give songwriters out there, um, either new songwriters or just Pete Hobby as songwriters? What when they when they're writing a song, what kind of advice could you give them? That's a really hard one. I've got uh, quite a few people who's send me songs and I think it's and especially these days it's really hard. Uh, if I have a really good friend of mine, Phil Thornalley, who uh who's a really great, he was at Rack with me and he produced Natalie and and, and co-wrote the song um Torn. Yeah, great song. And he's with Brian Adams and very and he's he's a he's kind of gone from engineering producing into the songwriting thing. Right. And I had I had a lunch with him a while, short a short time ago, and he was saying to me that um it's really, really tough these days. He said, I only actually get songs placed if I do them with the artist now. So right. all the songs that, you know, like that he had a track with on, on Brian Adams' last album, which he co-wrote with him. And he said, that's anyway. And he's had quite a lot of success. Um, you know, I think it's very difficult. Um, another songwriter I work with, there's a guy called Jack McManus. I don't know if you know Jack. I don't. He's a great songwriter. Um and he does get songs placed. He has great publishing here and in America. Um, and he's really proactive. He's he he actually comes whatever on various artists we work with. He often comes to the studio when right. we're recording it, just because yeah. he likes to be there. He doesn't come there to say, oh, "What are you doing that for?" or "Why have you changed that?" He actually just likes to be a part of the process. And he, he'll come for a day and then go off again. Um, and he's been he's been you know very, very successful. Um, and I think he plugs himself. You know, in a really positive way. Um, so I don't know. I, it's hard for me to say, to be honest with you. Is that the hustle? Uh, as, you know, as you know yourself, it's placing songs is it, it can be tricky. And I'm not sure that um, in the old days you used to have publishing houses. You know, you have people that would you take your song to the publishing, and then they would get they would go around the record companies and say, you know, we have this song, that song. That doesn't really happen so much anymore. I think the best thing to do would be to team up with a um a singer songwriter or a band or whatever and team up with someone yeah and do it that way that was what, that uh, what, like. what that's the kind of hustle industry side sort of advice but if you if you could take it back to like musicality or creativity side what kind of advice would you give a songwriter from the some from the kind of point of view of creative records rather than the kind of like success side of it what, what advice would you give a song well, I, think, I think i think yeah go i think go with what what's what what's what you you know you, what you feel truthful about i mean just write the songs that, that mean something yeah it's, well, that, that's i think that's always the um you can always tell when a, a song's really been written with with her heart and um yeah i think i get a lot of songs actually I, I, had, I had a couple of songs from a i went say who it was but um from a from a guy that i know and and i noticed, I noticed the song and i thought it doesn't sound like anything. It sounds like a bit's been taken from that song, right? A bit's been taken from that song. Uh, it actually leaves me really flat, mm. um, you know. And basically, it's it's like a real, it's like a second rate. And yeah. I didn't say that to to him, but that's yeah. what I felt. Yeah. Um, but if it had been kind of a, like a song that was, was really passionate, um, like your song, I hope you know. I think it's a great song. Thank you. Yeah, so I think it's one of the best things we've done, if I may say so. But um, thank you. Yeah, because yeah. I remember I still listen to we listen to that in the house. You know, it, it, it's still on, even now, and I think I think it sounds great because it's it's a great song from the heart, and it's really simple the way it's mm -hmm. sung, just acoustic guitar and your voice. And um, I think you should plug that a bit more and try and get that on. That one well, something that you said to me, I and mean, this is the great thing about like I'm saying earlier about the I think songwriters out there, if you whatever level, I think you know. There's one thing recording tracks in your bedroom and making your own records, but from my experience, when you work with people like I've had the pleasure to work with Pete and Chris Potter and Jim Lowe and other people, it's like you when you're in a room with someone who knows what they're doing, um, they hear in different ways and they give you feedback. And one of the things you said to me was like, concentrate more on your guitar plucking and your playing because like on our records, for example, there's quite a big sound and quite a lot going on, but 
but I don't know, maybe maybe even like two albums ago, you said that, like to like bring that element out. And that is what we're working on at the moment, because it's something which stuck with me of like, and, and stuck with Ava, who, who mentioned it this time, like don't play so much rhythm, bring out the plucking. So yeah. what I'm saying, the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, I believe in kind of the old industry, like if you like, where there's mastering engineers and engineers and, and producers and their role is that significant as it's very significant to make a record. So if if you like you were saying team up with people and as producers and engineers and build relationships because that advice when someone knows your work really well and they can give you some advice that you could give to me or Kevin and and it is really helpful as a songwriter because someone's helping you just maybe hear or see something that you can't hear or see because you're too involved with yourself you know so that's absolutely. that's that's the role of you guys you know yeah absolutely and, and I think one of the sad, although I love, um, I'm sitting here in my studio now, on my own, you know, in in, in beautiful Dorset, um, but I really miss that um, being, you know, in a in a studio with, with um, recording and with people around, because a lot of the times, uh, it's, well, it's more creative, isn't it? Because you people say, have you, how about trying that? Or I don't know. I mean, the, what am I, the, the it's just great having um, people around. Who and also if 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 you a you have a laugh, yeah, and which, which also comes out in the music. I think if 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 if, you, if it feels like it's been fun joy. to make it, yeah, joy. I know it's a yeah. Thing to say, but it does, I think, come over. Mm, um, think. You know, and I mean, like the, uh, with the like we were talking about Kevin's latest album, which is just like, out, literally out today. That was all done with me and uh, a really really good um, keyboard player programmer who I work with a lot, Toby Chapman, who's a really talented guy, and Kevin. And basically, it was the three of us. It was all done, right? Uh, between the, and and it was it was it was great. And Kevin actually, Kevin loved it because he said, "Oh, P, I haven't got that a nine piece band to work out, and I haven't got to go into a studio and get all stressed." He says, yeah. "It's been really." He actually said to me at one point, "He said he's a bloody help." He said, "I've just realised I've I've done all my all my parts, and I haven't even thought about it." Wow. So he loved it, but I I actually did, I kind of um, missed not being in the room with him and right. You know, and yeah. having that express, but um, yeah. So I think it's 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 difficult, isn't it? I think um, but I think if you are working with people like engineers, and you say mastery engineers, it, it all it all adds to it. Yeah, I agree. you know, that, I think so. One of the great things about about music, I agree. The team, the team is important. Yeah, definitely from the band. To and you have you also you also have a great relationship with with Chris. You know, I know, you know, and he's 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 great, isn't he? And he. He's such a chilled, nice guy, very talented, and um, brings out the best in people by just being well, there and like being. You know, I've, I've I think it's kind of interesting the relationship because I mean, you you and him, have, I think you both didn't you both like train at Rack or something. There's there's something that you both have, and it was a similar thing, which is basically right, reliable, trustworthy, relaxed, calm. Uh, the head, the captain is at the table. They've got the control of the wheel. You can trust. And so the the artist, the manic artist, who's like got a million ideas at one, or you know, all that stuff. Both of you have this like very solid thing. And and it, what it, what it does as a songwriter or an artist, it allows you to feel like someone's got is is in control and got your back. And it's like I mean, when we were doing vocals for the wild, like our second album with you, you know, Ava was has she said that she's never felt as comfortable or sounded as good with any producer other than you in that moment, because you just set it, whatever you did was like, she felt felt like she was able to access areas of her voice and be supported in a way which was like, just magnificent. So, you know, when you have that experience, then you can go into yourself and pull something else out you didn't know was there. So you and Chris both mm -hmm. have that way of, making people feel calm and 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 listened to and safe and and kind of supported which is massively important so a thank you and, and b just a note from a songwriter's point of view oh no, i mean that's lovely to hear you know i mean i think i learned from an early stage probably working with mickey probably was how important it was to make the, the song the singer but all the all the musicians but especially the singer feel um comfortable and and I always I always try to make sure that the headphones are as good as yeah. I can make them I'm yeah. trying to think how how would you want to hear the headphones 
and I try to make them sound the way I think this that the singer mm. will, would like them to sound. Did I tell you a story? I, I was working with um, a band called uh, the other ones, a, a German Australian part German part Australian band who were quite successful in the eighties. And and Janie, the singer, was quite nervous. Quite this was only their second album, I think. And I we were recording at Rack, and I we were doing all the backing tracks. And again, I was quite young as a producer in those days. And I, she kept on saying, should I do some vocals then? And I said, no, don't worry, Jenny, we'll, we'll do them. And I left, I thought, I'm sure I have to do this. And we left it and left it and left it until like we'd been in the studio for eight weeks. And then she, then I said, oh, well, we're ready to do vocals now. And she completely froze and couldn't, she couldn't get it. You know, she was so nervous. And I realized that to my, in my, my error that I'd, I should have put her in, the, in front of the microphone the, the first or second day and just get her singing every day and it would yeah, be yeah. fine. Yeah. I mean, luckily it worked out all right because we managed to get her, you know, into into comfortable uh, where she felt comfortable and it was all right. But I, I thought at one point I'd blown it because I right. got yeah. her into this state of of, of you know I, I can't do this I can't do this and yeah, yeah, of course yeah. she could. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's very important. And that's lovely. Yeah, thank you. I've heard it before that it said before though, but um, um, by another producer that part of, they said like fifty percent of their job is like being a counselor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, but like this, yeah. I find that to be true. That is true. Trevor Horton said that to me. He said, he said my job is sitting on the sofa at the back of the room, you know, talking to the um, talking to the artists most of the time, yeah. and telling them stories, but nothing to do with what we were doing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I remember we did um, we did a Rod Stewart track, a, a downtown train with Rod, uh, Rod Stewart, mm. um, and and he was hilarious. I love I really love working with him. Um, and re a real performer. He was a real show. But even in the studio, the shirt would come off, and he, you know. Be in yeah. front of the microphone, and he, his girlfriend that was um, uh, Kelly Emberg, I think, is that right? And um, very stunning model, and she was there, so he was like performing for her, and she was the control room, and Trevor, Trevor was like overseeing this whole thing, and there's little me just sitting there recording it, <laughs> just making sure I got everything onto tape. Yeah, um, and it was, it was brilliant, and it, and it was, he did he came in and he actually sang on to the demo. Actually, we'd done a demo. And he did it. I think he did three or four takes. Um, and I said, like I said, he took he took a shirt off. He would have been about forty then, and it was like yeah, you know, height of his career. And it was really, really great. And and um, then then we did all we did all the, we did all the recording, all the all the proper drums and bass was all redone. The orchestra was put on it. I think it was Anne Dudley did the the arrangement. Um, and then Trevor flew over to America to do the vocal for for real. And um, and then I got a phone call from Trevor saying, um, "What microphone did you use, Pete?" Um, I said, "Well, why? What, you know?" He said, "Well, Rod's having a real problem. He said he he loves the sound that we did in in England, and it's not sounding as good. And he's getting he's getting really stressed out because it doesn't sound as good." Uh, um, so I told him, I said, "I, I use this, this, and that. You know, it was nothing special necessarily, but I know what it was. It was a Telefunken 251, very lovely microphone." Um, and a focus right mic camp in the year 1176 and I, so I told him that and then the next day he said um, he rang again he said oh, Pete it still doesn't sound right you know he, 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 Ross not happy. he thinks he wants to do it in a different key and we recorded the whole thing and this is back in the days where it wasn't easy just to change yeah, the key yeah, 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 yeah. and I said bloody hell Trevor what do you mean so he said yeah no it's just not happening it's not happening um, so in the end he came back and we transposed the whole thing down, going through a Lexicon 480 and God knows what, and redid some of the guitars. And then he went back and sang it again, but it never sounded as good mm. as the demo. The demo vocal was probably used on 75% of the whole track. Right. It's quite a funny, quite a funny story. And do you think that was partly because he had his top off singing to his girlfriend? Yeah. <laughs> probably I, think it, I yeah. think he felt really relaxed. It was a demo. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he was like just happy, you know. He just sang it, and he yeah, sounded yeah. great. I mean, he did sound great, I have to say. <laughs> but um, yeah, he didn't have actually another one. If I without being boring, I was doing um, a, with the Pet Shop Boys, we we're doing the film, The Crying Game, which Boy George sang the the theme song, the 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 theme track, yeah, which was written by the Pet Shop Boys, and we did it at Psalm, and we were doing the track, and um, Neil Neil Tennant said to me. A boy George is coming down to, to to do some demos on on the track to make sure it's the right key and whatever blah blah blah, 
And so Paul George, he came down, he sang the song twice. Luckily, I didn't. Luckily, I did it on two tracks. I didn't erase it. I kept everything he did. And then, and then we carried on working. And then Neil rang him, said, oh, "We've finished the track. Do you want to come back?" And Boy George said, "Oh no, I'm not coming back. I'm, I'm done. I've done my vocal." Yeah. Um, and that was it. That was the. Yeah. And I, I did actually spend a lot of time tuning it, and I shouldn't really say <laughs> much. He raised that bit. Brilliant. But, um, I um, spent a lot of time, a lot of time um, manipulating it to um, to sound as good as I could make it. I had to DS it and all sorts. And um, but that was what that was. And actually, I listened to it. It sounds great. You know, you wouldn't. Yeah, you know, he was, he was probably right, you know, but we were really pissed off. We were saying, oh, come on, you know, you need to come and sing it. We need, you know, well, we need this proper is, vocal. This is the thing, isn't it? It's like sometimes, you, you know, you're working, you have to work with what you what the circumstances are or, and then where the artist's heads are at. And sometimes you have to like try and make some, and the impossible possible. And sometimes you just capture something in a room and that's the, the never ending changing love of it is because it's always different and it's always, you know, yeah. it's uh but let Pete, thank you so much for your time and for your insights. You're welcome. You. You're welcome. Um, the, the sort of songwriting and record making from over the wall as it were. But I have one question that I ask every songwriter, which I'm going to ask you slightly differently. Um, I normally ask a songwriter what song they would have loved to have written. So I'm going to ask you what, song would you have liked to have made into a record that you haven't you know if there was a song out there that you, what would you choose what would you have loved to have made into a record do you mean one that i that it that was um was has been done that i wish i had done yeah or yeah. if you like one one that or one that's been done that you could wish you could do do better maybe so, like, well, well, i'm not sure <laughs> well i wish i mean i i wish i i mean i think probably it's quite I wish I wish I worked on Bohemian Rhapsody. That would be amazing. Sure, 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 yeah, sure. yeah. I yeah. think and there's lots of lots of great records that aren't there, but that that one, partly because of my age and and what it and, and growing up, um, and partly because it's probably one of the most brilliantly written songs. Yeah. I mean, you get these songwriters who are like ten people writing a song these days. You know, that's like Freddie and the band just knocking out a song. Yeah. It's just pure genius, isn't it? It's it's uh, power is. It has I think been... so, and also because I, I was lucky to work to work lucky enough to work on the miracle with with um, the band, and um, and as I said, I worked with Brian a lot, and um, and I remember, I think in my head when I was there, I was thinking, I wish we could, I hope we hope we got another Bohemian Rhapsody coming out, you know, hope hope Brian's got something up his sleeve, you know, yeah, yeah, um, was it, that would be, yeah, um, that would be amazing, but yeah, I think probably that song. Great, answer. and there's quite a few. There's quite a few that, but that one in particular. Brilliant, Pete. Thank you so much for your time, mate, and um, good luck with all the uh, with yeah. the Dexy's album and all the other albums and uh, songwriters out there. If you're if you're kind of uh, you should go and check out Pete's website, peteschweer dot com, and, and just tune into all the records he's made, and and uh, maybe even get in touch if you uh, want to work with him. I can highly recommend this man as a legend. So thank you, Pete, for your time. You're very welcome. Thanks, Elijah, and I'll see you soon. Cheers, mate.